Discussion today on the constitutional, constitutionality of Obamacare. I'd like to take a moment to uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, this kind of turnout is what's going to be able to propel uh, FedSoc to continue to have uh, future events, especially in this kind of forum where we can discuss and somewhat debate and hear multiple sides and multiple facets of legal issues so that you can get fully informed and then make your own decision as to what you believe is the, uh, the right or legal thing to do in a certain situation. Uh, that being said, I'd like to introduce our two distinguished guests today. Uh, on my left is Professor Josh Blackman. And a little bit of background on, uh, on Josh for those that haven't seen his ubiquitous presence. Ubiquitous. Oh, boy. Speaking circuit or on the blogosphere. Oh, boy. Uh, Josh comes to uh, Texas by way of New York, having been one of the uh, folks who escape the liberal bastion of the New York City area. <laughs> I go back there often. They, I have a visa they, to they enter. Let you, they let you? Yeah, I have a special dispensation at the airport. They let me through. Yeah, extra search. Yeah, I get, I get, I get patted the down. Full, the, yeah, the, full the attorney general of New Jersey doesn't like me very much either. <laughs> uh, Josh, Josh got his BA at uh, Penn State and then went to George Mason University to get his JD in uh, Virginia. Uh, from there, you clerked at uh, Western District of Pennsylvania, followed by the Sixth Circuit. Good memory, yeah. Thanks, I got it in front of me. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to make you look good. You're not. You're not. <laughs> that takes a lot. Um, Josh, since uh, 2012, has taught a variety of classes at uh, South Texas College of Law, primarily constitutional law and property. And in his spare time, travels around the country in upwards of giving 50 talks a year, hundreds of media appearances, and written two books on subject, one unprecedented in 2013, and then unraveled in 2016, which can be purchased where, Josh? <laughs> Amazon at a steep discount. It's like now like five bucks, so there's no reason not to buy a copy. The, the sympathetic pitch here is that uh, Josh has a four-month-old at home, so anything, I, anything that can be done. To, I make no money from these books. There's, uh, he'll agree uh, the royalties are a pittance. They, 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 they're not. But thank you. Thank All you. Right. <laughs> um, well, then, thank you for being here. Josh. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And then, uh, following Josh's presentation, we have our very own Professor Omar Dijani. And uh, as most of you already know, Professor Dijani here, but I will give a little bit of background. Uh, on professor anyway. Uh, Northwestern University followed by Yale Law and also clerked, clerked for the Ninth Circuit. Uh, did a little bit of time, worked at a firm in uh, DC that was uh, Sydney and Austin. Did a little time, that sounds like prison. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> why I feel here. So I, I, I wanted to see if it would be the same. The gilded cage at Sydney, uh, Austin. <laughs> while, uh, while at Sydney and Austin, uh, Professor Dijani uh, dealt with constitutional issues, trade issues, white collar crime, and did corporate defense of healthcare industry. Evil side comments. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> speaking of, uh, we mentioned Josh's escape. Uh, Professor Johnny was able to escape the corporate defense of healthcare world. Uh, and also, as a side note, you escaped, Tyler, you Tyler, escaped Texas. Tyler, Texas, That's right. and ended up in California. So, so, so you both ended up where you were meant to be. So congratulations on that. Thank you. <laughs> I love, I love since, this intro. This is, intro is since, usually pretty boring. Since, after, after his escape from uh, corporate defense healthcare, uh, <laughs> Professor Johnny actually followed his passion and spent quite a number of years dealing with the Middle East peace process in a variety of different uh, capacities. He was a member of the Palestinian Negotiation Support Unit and then also went to the UN where he served on the Middle East peace process uh, both in New York and Jerusalem. Um, since 2012, when uh, Professor McGeorge, uh, uh, 2003 rather, Professor uh, Dijani joined us here at McGeorge and also had stints teaching both at Hastings and the American University in Cairo. 
uh, currently teaches my constitutional law class, uh, contracts, and then a variety of classes on international law, which we are very appreciative of to have here. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand off to Professor Black. Thank you so much. Um, the topic today is Obamacare unconstitutional. And you may ask yourself, wait a minute, Josh. Didn't we already do this, right? Didn't the Supreme Court already resolve the constitutionality of Obamacare back in 2012 when you probably were all in like high school or something, right? Why, why are we still here, right? Why have we not written two and almost three books on Obamacare? Um, this is the law that refuses to die, that refuses to go away. Uh, uh, the challenges and attacks on this law have been um, nonstop for basically a decade. Uh, so my goal here today is to walk you through the current challenge, the Affordable Care Act, um, where it is, where it's headed, and what the Supreme Court is likely going to do. Our story really has to begin back in 2012 with NFIB versus Sibelius. This was the Supreme Court's big Obamacare decision. If you want to spend $5 on a hardcover book, you can read my book Unprecedented, or I'll just describe a few here. Um, as many of you recall, uh, Chief Justice Roberts cast the deciding vote in NFIB. Okay? And he had a couple important conclusions that are often not well understood. So the first part of Roberts' opinion says, Congress can't mandate, right? Uh, Congress can't force people to purchase health insurance, right? That such a mandate um, goes beyond Congress's powers under the commerce and the necessary and proper clauses, right? So that's the first part. If I had stopped reading there, I would have been really happy that he then went on to the next part. And the next part, Robert said, is, well, but we have a duty as a court to find ways to uphold statutes if we can. And indeed, he found a way to uphold the Affordable Care Act. And I want to walk you through this opinion. Robert said, first off, we agree Congress can't make you buy insurance. But what Congress could do is impose a tax on you if you're uninsured. Now, Robert said, this is not the law that Congress passed, right? <coughs> Congress didn't actually enact a tax on going uninsured, but they did something that's very similar to that, right? The law imposes what it calls a penalty on people going uninsured. Um, you pay this penalty with your income tax return. Uh, the penalty is based in part on what your taxable income is. Uh, this penalty generates revenue, which the IRS collects when your taxes by Monday, by the way, April 15th coming up, right? Um, all of these facets of the penalty uh, resemble a tax. And here is Robert's key move. Robert says, um, we have this duty to uphold laws, and because we can read the penalty that enforces the mandate as a tax, we can uphold the law and be very precise. Roberts did not hold that the mandate was constitutional. He didn't say that. What he said is, I will read the statute as if there is a tax on going uninsured. The bottom line of NFIB is Roberts said is, we don't have to resolve the mandate of the constitution, I'm sorry, the constitutionality of the mandate because the law can be upheld on other grounds. That we uphold the penalty as if it were a tax and therefore there's no constitutional problem. Okay. That was a Roberts holding. I'm not here to argue about it. I can come back maybe another time and do that. But that was Roberts' holding. Um, that worked for 2012. And it was somewhat precarious in my mind. I'm thinking, OK, so, so long as the penalty resembles a tax, then it's constitutional. And I actually did some work on this. I, I thought, well, there's some places where, uh, uh, California in particular, where the penalty will be higher than other places. And maybe the uh, penalty becomes punitive in California. And these other sorts of things which didn't really matter. But it was sort of a side project. Fast forward to 2017. Uh, President Trump comes to office. And both the House and the Senate are controlled by Republicans. Uh, every Republican for the last decade has said, repeal and replace, repeal and replace, right? Uh, and actually, you had a bill pass the House that wouldn't have done either of those things, but would have at least modified the ACA in substantial terms. Um, didn't work in the Senate. Senator McCain, if you remember, put his thumbs down, and that was thumbs down to a repeal and replace effort. So then the Republicans regrouped. 
And they did it in an unlikely place. The tax cut bill, right? The Tax Cut and Job Act of 2017 uh, was passed in December of 2017. This bill did a lot of things. I am not an expert on tax law. I won't even pretend to explain to you what it did. But there was one part that I do care about. Uh, one aspect of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act said, we are reducing the penalty, the ACA penalty, from about $700, give or take, to zero dollars. Okay, more time. The penalty was about 700 bucks. The tax bill dropped it down to zero dollars. That's all it did. Okay, uh, they didn't have the votes to repeal the mandate. They didn't have the votes to repeal anything else in Obamacare. All they did was cut the penalty down to zero. Um, and and th this is significant, right? Because now if a person goes uninsured, uh, they don't have to pay a penalty, right? Uh, a lot of my students during the Obamacare years decided to go uninsured. They thought it was a better decision and they would just simply pay the penalty every year. It was cheaper than buying insurance. Smart or not, I'll let you guys decide, but it was a, it was a decision people made. Now, there is no financial consequence if any of you decide to go uninsured. Okay. That's a policy matter. Healthcare, not my issue. I'm here for talk about the Constitution, I think. Um, as this bill was going through Congress, I thought, huh, if Congress strikes out the penalty, then Obamacare is unconstitutional. Right? I had this thought. Right? It, was, it, was, it was very obvious to me that this would happen. Right? I'm sure some of the members of Congress had the same thought. I've actually studied the legislative history. I can't find any statements on the floor where Republicans said, aha, if we pass this bill, we kill Obamacare. So no one actually said that. But it occurred to me. I'm sure it occurred to some smart lawyers in this room also. All right, so the bill passes, President Trump signs into law, and then several months later, we get a lawsuit. It was actually orchestrated by the Wisconsin Attorney General, uh, and, but it was filed in Texas. Uh, now Texas is in the lead. And the lawsuit alleged that the ACA is no longer constitutional. That by dropping the penalty down to zero dollars and zero cents, Chief Justice Roberts' saving construction can no longer hold. Think of like a house of cards, right? And if you pull out one card on the middle, they said the entire thing topples down. That's the argument. Um, this argument has two components, right? First, is the mandate unconstitutional? And second, if the mandate's unconstitutional, what happens to the rest of the law? And that's, that's where I want to focus most of my time on today. Um, the first question I think is actually uh, a lot easier, right? Uh, I'll put aside standing for a minute. I might come back to standing later. No one even usually cares about standing, but I can do that later if you want. But let's just talk, standing is not sexy. You want to go to the merits, right? Thank you, thank you. I'll, if you, I'll do standing later if you want. Um, let's talk about the merits for a minute. Uh, Roberts' opinion laid out certain what I call guardrails. He said, I can construe the ACA penalty as a tax because it meets certain criteria. For example, it raises revenue, right? You pay it along with your income tax return. Uh, it resembles a tax in a lot of regards. Um, all the things that Roberts identified in 2012 are no longer true. It doesn't raise revenue, it's not put in your tax return, it's not a tax, it doesn't look like a tax at all. Okay, so if that part is right, I think that's a lot easier part, we can say that the mandate's unconstitutional. Okay, if the court were to declare the mandate unconstitutional and just the mandate, um, it wouldn't have much of a practical significance. I think there's some effect, but I, nothing, nothing huge, right? But the other part of the Obamacare challenge is a little bit bigger. Um, let's go about severability. Um, severability is a weird doctrine in the law, right? Usually when you challenge, say a statute has five sections, and you challenge section one, and the court says that section one's unconstitutional, the court says we will declare section one unconstitutional, and that's it. But severability is a little bit different. It goes like this, it says, well, if Congress was involved, and you told Congress, we're gonna strike out section one, would they still have enacted sections two, three, four, and five? And the courts basically have to like imagine this fake congressional debate that never happened, right? Of how Congress would have treated an incomplete version of the statute without section one of the law. I'll give you a gross example that's a lot easier to understand. Let's say you have a gangrene toe, 
right? Your, th your toe is infected. What's the remedy? Well, maybe you can amputate one toe. Maybe you have to amputate two toes. Maybe the entire foot can't exist. Maybe you have to amputate below the knee. Maybe the entire leg has to go. Or maybe it kills the patient, right? When you have something bad in a statute, it can operate in bizarre ways. So the question is, how should the ACA operate in the absence of the individual mandate? And there are four possible doors to go through, and I'll go through them one at a time. Door number one, you kill the mandate, and you only kill the mandate, nothing more. Right, this is the most simple approach. Um, and again, the effect of doing this would uh, uh, basically be not much because people aren't paying the penalty anyway. Okay, door number two. You kill the mandate and then you kill parts of the ACA. Now the parts you have to kill are actually fairly popular. Uh, the most popular parts of Obamacare are the protections for sick people. Uh, this is what's known as guaranteed issue and community rating. Right, these are the pre-existing condition protections. A guaranteed issue says that the insurance companies have to issue policies to everybody who wants to buy one. And community rating says you price or you rate the policy based on what a person in that community would pay, not on a person's individual health factors. Um, back in 2012, the Obama administration took the position that if the court struck down the mandate, the court would also have to strike down the guaranteed issue and community rating. Now this was a bold decision from President Obama. Maybe it was a little bit of a, of, of a, of a, of a, of a bluff saying, hey, you guys want to kill the bad part, you have to kill the good parts as well. But I think as a matter of law, Eric Holder got it right. Uh, the reason why the mandate existed was to prevent what's called a death spiral. What's a death spiral? Think about it this way. If the insurance companies are required to insure you, right, what's your incentive for buying insurance early? Why don't you just wait till you get sick? And when you get sick, you go to buy your policy, right? But if you make people buy it right away and they're already in the marketplace, they're paying fees and they're lowering premiums for everyone, right? That's the position that Obama took in 2012. I think that was actually the right position, that the mandate goes, the guaranteed issue also has to go. Right, so that's door number two. We kill the guaranteed issue community rating. Um, door number three is actually the route taken by a district judge in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, a few months ago, he issued a decision uh, uh, in the Obamacare case and he declared that the entire ACA is now unconstitutional. Uh, for what it's worth, he cited my, my, my scholarship like five times. I always get cited in unpopular decisions. It's how my stuff works. Uh, it's one of, the, one of the joys of my job. Uh, but the judge said the entire law has to go. Uh, this was actually the position taken in 2012 by the joint dissenters. If you remember Justice Scalia, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito argue that the mandate goes all of Obamacare has to go. Now, stuff changed since 2012, right? Something changed, and I think it's important to acknowledge this change. Um, in 2012, we had a law with the mandate, and then 2017, Congress passed a law, whoops, I'm sorry. Congress passed a law that zeroed out the penalty. Now, the, the defenders of the law say, well, because Congress zeroed out the penalty, they basically acknowledge that you don't really need the mandate. Right? So whatever the intent was in 2012 is irrelevant, right? Congress issued another intent by signaling we don't need the penalty, the mandate's meaningless. Um, I think the response to this, which the judge in Texas kind of got around to, is that they only modified one aspect of the bill in 2017. They only touched the penalty. Um, they didn't touch the actual mandate. And they didn't touch the findings. Um, when the ACA was enacted, there were statutory findings in the statute that said the mandate is essential to the operation of the law, the mandate's essential for guaranteed issue. Uh, the findings said nothing about the penalty. So you have different ways of reading legislative history. You can say, well, we know what Congress really intended based on their actions in 2017, but they didn't put that into words. And you have an actual statute which says the mandate's essential and that statute's still in the books. So what do we look to when we're determining legislative history? And I suppose it's easy to say, of course Congress in 2017 didn't care about the mandate anymore. Uh, they did nothing to put that into effect, right? Their statute doesn't reflect that. And I am at heart a formalist, which not everyone agrees with, uh, but I think a written statute that's not repealed is not repealed by implication. 
and that the findings from 2012 still have weight. Okay, but let's say, say Josh, you're insane, right? You're wrong, this is stupid, Congress didn't want to do this in 2017. Well, let's talk about door number four. Right, door number four is the most intriguing one. Follow me here. Obamacare was constitutional in 2012. John Roberts said so. Right. Obamacare was constitutional until the moment President Trump signed the tax cut. The minute the president signed the tax cut, Obamacare became unconstitutional. So what's the remedy? You undo the thing Trump did. Judges are very good at that nowadays, right? You say the tax cut itself was the unconstitutional act. The tax cut is what rendered Obamacare unconstitutional. So the remedy is to strike out the tax cut. Reinstate the $700 penalty. Because if you reinstate the penalty, there's no question that Obamacare now fits within the John Roberts paradigm. He upheld that exact law. And there's actually some precedent for that. There's an old case called Frost from the 1920s where the court suggested that if a later in time legislature modifies a statute to make it unconstitutional, the remedy is to set aside the action of the later in time Congress. I know it sounds insane and counterintuitive, but it may actually be the, the correct legal uh, uh, option. And again, that, this is against interest, right? This is Josh arguing that you bring Obamacare back to life, you resuscitate it. This is not something I particularly like, but I think legally uh, it, has some, it, ha it has an appeal. Uh, but, and here comes a huge but, but, which the judge sided me for. It was like a, it was like a footnote this long. But um, in this case, no one challenged tax cut. Um, no one said the tax was unconstitutional. Uh, federal judges, despite their ambiance, don't have the power to strike out whatever laws they want in the US code. They can't just take a red pencil, flip the US code, and say, aha, that's bad, that's bad. Uh, courts have a limited menu of options, so to speak, of what laws they can set aside. So I don't think in the Texas case, an option would be to set aside the um, tax cut. Uh, there's another case filed in Maryland by the Maryland Attorney General, his name is Tom Goldstein, no it's not, but basically the Maryland AG hired Tom Goldstein to be his de facto SG. Uh, um, they do this now, it's fun, right? Uh, big law can now be, be effectively a private government enforcement. <laughs> and Maryland argued that tax cuts are constitutional. Now that case, that remedy might be in play. Now, there are standing problems there for other reasons maybe I'll talk about later, but I think the remedy might be available in the Maryland case. Okay, so those are the four options. Um, again, the, the judge in Fort Worth took door number three. Now let's talk about the DOJ. Initially, the DOJ took door number two. Right, that you kill the mandate plus the guaranteed issue. This was the position they took earlier. It made sense. Uh, a few weeks ago, after the judge in Texas ruled, we get a letter from the Attorney General, actually his deputy, and the letter says, uh, we're changing our position. We now agree with the judge in Texas. We now agree that the entire ACA has to go. And just two days ago, DOJ filed a letter with the Fifth Circuit. And they said, we want to expedite this case. Pick up the pace. Let's get to the Supreme Court quicker. Um, so we are now on a collision course, once again, between Obamacare and the US Supreme Court. Omar, I'm just deja vu. I feel like I've been giving the same talk for a decade, my entire, like, I started teaching about four months after the John Roberts decision. It's so like my entire life has been like the same thing. And Obamacare is going to the Supreme Court. I can just put like a robot on repeat, on repeat. It's, it's this deja vu feeling. Uh, so here we go back to the Supreme Court. Um, the case we first heard by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, which is uh, a fairly conservative court. Um, and I think there's a non-trivial chance that Judge O'Connor's ruling from Fort Worth is upheld at least in part or perhaps in whole. And if my math is right, and, and Omar check me on this, uh, if we get a decision by the fall, uh, summer, fall, I think we're able to get Supreme Court to review it by maybe March or so, um, which would mean a decision on this uh, by June of 2020, uh, right around the time of the national convention, uh, a couple months before the election. Um, so you can see where I'm going with this, right? Uh, it's been widely reported in books by Joan Biskup and others that Chief Justice Roberts had a strong desire to keep uh, the Supreme Court out of the headlines in the 2012 election, right? He rose a decision uh, shortly before the Obama-Romney election. 
Uh, and if history, if past is prologue, as, as it usually is, if history repeats itself, which it does, uh, I think there are many reasons why Chief Justice Roberts <laughs> would not want this case to be in the headlines so close to a presidential election. Um, the Supreme Court can probably duck the issue, right? If the Fifth Circuit reverses and holds that uh, the Obamacare law is fine, then I think the Supreme Court will just deny review. Uh, but if the Court of Appeals affirms, at least in any part, and says that at least some part of the ACA has to go, uh, then I think the Supreme Court has to take the case. Um, at which point, John Roberts will do what he does to me every June, is, which is break my heart, um, and, fi and find ways to break my heart in new, in new and cr innovative ways. It's like, I think it's his habit. I actually had this dream the other night, it's, it's bizarre, but that John Roberts wrote me a handwritten letter apologizing for something, explaining something he did, saying, I'm sorry, Josh. <laughs> I swear, it was, it was, it was so realistic. It was like, I know what I did, here's why I did it. I'm, you know, I'm sorry, Josh. Uh, I'm sure I keep him awake at night. I keep, I keep all the justices awake at night. I'm sure I do. They say, oh, that black one's going to tweet about me. Uh, <laughs> but the reason why this is important is we are now at an odd junction of law and politics. Um, uh, the Republican Party spent many years trying to fashion some sort of Obamacare replacement, and nothing stuck. And I think in part because anything they would have done would have made the protections for health care less than was before. Whatever it is, if, if Obamacare is X, the Republican plan is X minus Y. Whatever that, whatever that thing is, it's something less. And I think the Democrats have been very effective saying, oh, we can't take away care from people. Even if it's more affordable, none of that stuff matters. Uh, President Trump, though, has been repeatedly tweeting about how amazing it'll be when the courts kill Obamacare and how it will just create this opportunity for the Republicans to be the party of health care. Indeed, after, let me get this tweet. I wonder, I, if I misquote the President's tweet, I think I'd, I'd feel... Um, I think I feel, I, feel, I feel remorse. He said, quote, wow, but not surprisingly, Obamacare was just ruled unconstitutional, all caps, by a highly, <laughs> by a highly respected judge in Texas. Great news for America. Um, next tweet, a few minutes later. Uh, as I predicted all along, Obamacare has been struck down as an unconstitutional, all caps, disaster, exclamation point. Now Congress must pass a strong, all caps, law that provides great, all caps, healthcare, it protects pre-existing pre conditions. Mitch and Nancy get it done. Uh, <laughs> so this was the, these were his tweets shortly after Judge O'Connor's decision. And he's recently tweeted, you know, well, Supreme Court kills Obamacare, we the party of healthcare, and it goes on and on. You know, we all know how this probably ends and this case doesn't go anywhere. Uh, but I think this creates fairly bad optics for the Republican Party. Uh, I think lots of moderate Democrats can run on this. Uh, uh, that now Republicans are backing this lawsuit. And in fact, a lot of Republicans want this case to simply go away. Uh, uh, and as it turns out, uh, the Attorney General was testifying in, in Congress the other day. They were asking about the Mueller report, which I don't really care about here, but they asked about Obamacare. And he said at one point to a, a, Congress, uh, a congressperson, he said, uh, if you think this case is so stupid, don't worry about it. In other words, if you think this case is like so unlikely to succeed, what are you worried about? Uh, anyway. So I think I'll stop here, uh, and maybe we can have a little discussion later. Uh, but this is, again, the case that just will not go away. I think on the mandate, Texas is probably right. I think the severability question has some difficulties that even the judge in Texas didn't quite grapple with. Um, I would be OK, and I mean this sincerely, if the court just kills the mandate. I would consider that a moral victory. I would I mean that John Roberts meant what he said. I'd be OK with that. Uh, beyond that, I'm still. I know this sounds you don't believe me, but I think I'm still in the fence. I think it's a hard question. All right, I'll stop here, turn over to my friend, and uh, we'll take some questions later. Thank you all so much. Thanks very much, Josh, uh, for a really thoughtful presentation. Um, if you all haven't had a chance to look at uh, Josh's uh, website and blog, I really encourage you to, to do so. Um, he and I have different politics uh, about a range of things, uh, but uh, he brings a level of rigor um, and a breadth of perspective to constitutional analysis that I think uh, makes consulting what he has to say, particularly in this arena, um, uh, really imperative. So, uh, so definitely give it a look. Um, and Josh, I, as someone who has uh, worked on the uh, Palestinian-Israeli conflict uh, for much of my <laughs> career, I can relate to uh, uh, problems that never seem to die. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so there's, uh, 
uh, a lot, there are a lot of uh, uh, questions raised by this um, issue and by Josh's presentation. And um, with a view toward ensuring that we have time for some discussion from all of you down the line, I'll try to keep my comments fairly narrow and brief, um, but I'm certainly happy to elaborate. Um, and uh, I see at least one student sort of smirking when I say, I'll try to keep my comments narrow and brief. <laughs> They've heard that before. Um, um, but uh, so let, let me uh, start off by doing what uh, your uh, GLS um, and moot court instructors tell you never to do, um, which is to begin with a losing argument. Um, and um, the losing argument uh, that I'd like to start with um, and that I will uh, just dispose of quickly, is that in my view, uh, the Affordable Care Act um, should always have been upheld as a constitutional exercise of the commerce power. Uh, I think the fact that Chief Justice Roberts took the step he did for reasons that I think uh, Josh is exactly right about, um, a desire to insulate the court at a tricky moment from the glare of political controversy. Um, I think that's the reason why he took the tax route he did. Uh, but I think that the concerns that he articulated with respect to the commerce power uh, were exaggerated. Um, uh, he, as you all uh, may recall, introduced a distinction uh, between um, action and inaction that was the basis for his conclusion that, um, the, that one of the frameworks that's used for determining whether or not uh, Congress is properly seen as regulating interstate commerce is um, assessing whether it's taking action to address activity that has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. What uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts said was, hey, um, what Congress is undertaking to do here is not regulate activity, but instead to regulate inactivity, um, to regulate inaction. Um, and this, he said, uh, was unprecedented. Um, and he offered up uh, both the view that we couldn't find in the court's history another example comparable to it, and the view uh, that it would unleash a whole array of new regulation by Congress upon American lives obliging us, among other things, to buy and eat broccoli. Um, this is in the opinion. Um, so uh, I won't dwell at great length on this losing argument because I don't think the court's going to reverse itself um, in uh, the immediate term. But I will say that uh, the action-inaction distinction finds no basis in the constitutional text, which refers to regulating interstate commerce. Um, and I think it also finds very little basis and Supreme Court precedent, which until the uh, National Federation of Independent Business decision um, had not emphasized uh, this particular decision, I mean, this particular distinction as being central to the framework um, inaugurated by the substantial effects framework introduced by the court in um, the 1930s. Uh, the last thing I'll say on this front before turning <coughs> forward to maybe more winning arguments is that um, in precisely the Texas District Court opinion um, that presumes to strike down the constitutionality, strike, strike down the Affordable Care Act on the basis of its uh, unconstitutionality, uh, Judge O'Connor begins by saying, the United States healthcare system touches millions of lives in a daily and deeply personal way. In the very first sentence of that opinion, uh, the judge acknowledges the extent to which this system has a sweeping effect on all of our lives. The notion that Congress' ability to regulate um, uh, that system, uh, uh, and again, not regulate in ways that touch our fundamental rights, that's not what's at issue here. Uh, what's at issue is whether Congress has the power to regulate, not whether there are equal protection or due process issues, which are a later stage in the analysis. The notion that Congress cannot do that seems to me preposterous, but that is uh, an argument that's finished. So um, the, the next thing I, I think it's important for us to bear in mind, and, and Josh uh, touched on this uh, during your presentation, 
um, is the political context in which the uh, 2017 uh, uh, tax cuts um, unfolded. Um, it's been written that uh, repeal and replace uh, died when uh, uh, Senator McCain failed to cast uh, a vote in support of it. But uh, it's also been the case that uh, repeal and replace has been supplanted by torture and disfigure um, as a strategy for responding to the Affordable Care Act. And um, we need to bear in mind as we think about uh, the case that is going forward and as we think about constitutional doctrines like severability, which I'll come to, we need to bear in mind the political context in which the attempt to repeal Obamacare was effected. Um, there was a, a sweeping Republican majority that uh, was well positioned. Um, it believed uh, to repeal a piece of hated legislation, but found over time that aspects of that legislation were not only not hated, um, but cherished by the American public. Um, they understood that it was going to be incredibly politically costly to repeal aspects of Obamacare, particularly the uh, pre-existing conditions um, uh, provision. And so um, they took the decision instead to lower the penalty to zero, uh, which had very substantial implications as far as um, uh, our uh, federal budget, um, in which they figured at best could be a political win without any really difficult consequences like repealing pre-existing conditions might have had, and um, at worst uh, might even result in the uh, circuitous uh, repeal by courts of the Affordable Care Act. To my mind, if there is any reason not to uh, take the approach that the uh, judge in Texas has taken, um, it is because at a level, level of political theory, putting aside um, our constitutional law, um, it strikes me as an incredibly problematic approach for the legislature to hard the hand the heart to hand the hard decisions, the politically fraught decisions, over the, to the judiciary, uh, which is um, uh, not accountable in the same ways. Um, if the legislature felt that repealing um, Obamacare uh, was critical, um, then it needed to do the work of getting enough votes uh, to do it. All right, um, two, two more issues and then I will uh, open the floor to all of you. Um, one issue which Josh just touched on and which I'll also just touch on, but which is, uh, I suspect, going to be very important once this gets to the Fifth Circuit and also potentially once it gets to the Supreme Court is standing. Um, remember that we now are dealing with a zero tax um, if one uh, fails uh, to comply with the individual mandate. If I fail to buy insurance, what happens to me? Nothing. Um, and so um, it's going to be very difficult for the plaintiffs um, who are bringing this case to explain the nature of the injury that they are suffering um, as a consequence of uh, this step. Now, the Texas uh, judge, uh, I keep referring to him to the Texas judge in the way that Californians refer to all things Texan as um, immediately suspect, but I can do that. <laughs> but I can only do it because I'm a Texan. Um, so, um, uh, so I have standing. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but the, uh, uh, but the Texas judge circumvented this by, Judge O'Connor circumvented this by suggesting that uh, there might be sort of a deep compulsion nevertheless to buy insurance. Um, and um, I uh, am uh, sympathetic to uh, kind of attenuated standing arguments, um, but our Supreme Court isn't. And so, um, uh, this will be an interesting opportunity for us to assess 
whether um, our court continues to have uh, courage, in its, uh, courage of its convictions when it comes to uh, standing in a context that they're not at all pleased about. Um, so, uh, uh, and that of course doesn't even speak to whether the states in question have standing in these circumstances. Finally, the issue of severability, and I'll end here. Um, I think that uh, it's important to bear in mind what is the touchstone of severability analysis, which is legislative intent. So what we are asking is, um, uh, did Congress, if we could put ourselves in Congress's position when it um, uh, adopted a particular provision, if it um, uh, could have uh, made the choice of whether, once it uh, 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 made a change, if it could have, um, I'm sorry, I'm not speaking very clearly here. Let me say this again. Um, once Congress has the sense that a particular provision has become unenforceable, um, it's got to uh, take a decision about, uh, sorry, let me say this again. The third time is the charm, right, Josh? So um, what we've got to figure out is, as of the moment that Congress adopts the position, if we could put ourselves in its shoes, if it understood uh, that a particular part of a statutory scheme would be eliminated, would it also have eliminated all of the rest of the statutory scheme? That's the, that's the question that we've got to ask. The thing is that in this situation, we don't have a very difficult analysis uh, to offer because Congress knew it was bringing the um, penalty down to zero and it failed to alter the rest of the statutory scheme. Um, one could even argue that it made the deliberate decision not to alter the rest of the statutory scheme. Let me just give you a quote by um, one person, or argue, or of course it's not in the um, legislative history, it's from CNN State of the Union, which is uh, rather more suspect as a source, but gives you a sense of how Susan Collins, Senator from Maine, was thinking about these questions. She said, there's no reason why the individual mandate provision can't be struck down and keep all of the good provisions of the Affordable Care Act, such as coverage for people with pre-existing conditions, the mandated benefits for substance abuse and mental illness treatment, and also allowing young people to stay on their parents' policies until age 26. Um, there was a choice made by an array of legislators to keep uh, the rest of the ACA in place, even if their predecessors in a different Congress in 2012 thought that um, the uh, tax penalty was essential to the legislative framework. Now, um, I think that the argument that Josh introduced at the end um, is, a, is an, an interesting argument. And uh, uh, there, uh, as you point out in, in your blog, it comes from a, um, uh, an article by uh, a couple of uh, recent Yale law grads, um, which shouldn't be a reason to discount it uh, right off the bat. The, the bat. Um, I, I think it is an interesting uh, argument to make, but uh, to my mind, uh, it, uh, we, we need not get there. We have um, a clear case in relation to standing and a clear case uh, in relation to uh, severability doctrine um, uh, with respect to what Congress's intent in 2017 was. Um, and for these reasons, um, even though uh, Medicare for all is really where we should be going, uh, we're stuck with the Constitutional Affordable Care Act for the time being. Thanks very much. Thank you all. All of our two brief rejoinders won't take questions. So first on standing, uh, how many of you done your taxes so far? Okay. Remember on your form there's that question that says, were you insured last year? And you check yes, and that's the end of it. You check no, you fill out the other form. Okay, there's your injury. Um, I know it sounds stupid, but it's an injury, right? Uh, the IRS asks you if you're insured. If you're not, you fill out a form. Uh, that might take you five minutes, pocketbook injury. <laughs> so I'm actually just waiting to make this argument much more boldly because I don't have the form yet. Uh, the IRS hasn't released the form. 
Uh, but I think in general, hiring accountants to plan tax prep for next year is a imminent injury. So I actually, I don't think injury's been a problem. The tax form, I've been young with this for, for about a year now. Uh, that's gonna resolve the standing. The states, I think, don't have standing. That's a silly argument. I don't think the states do. I'm sympathetic to the moral compulsion argument, though. I think if you have the government saying you must do something, people actually do respond in kind. In fact, the plaintiffs have said, we feel compelled to buy insurance. The harder problem is what's the injunction, right? Uh, don't enforce the law. What exactly is the injunction? You, and if you can't issue an injunction, you can't issue a declaration. But don't ask the tax question on the form, right? Don't ask the IRS question. Easy. So I actually don't think standing can be the problem, and I'm just waiting for the form to come out that'll make this argument much more publicly. Um, the severability argument, I, th I think Omar said exactly correct. Susan Collins said exactly what people in 2017 thought. The question is which Congress's intent matters, right? Where Congress A passes a bill and Congress B amends part of Congress A, uh, I think the, the dynamic's a little bit different. Uh, Congress could have decided to leave other parts of the law in place, but they only made one very small change. And this one cross case, this case from the 20s, is instructive. Uh, I think what the Congress in 2017 did is a nullity. Um, I think their intent is irrelevant. They screwed up, right? They, they told John Roberts, we don't care what you think, we're gonna now uh, uh, zero out the penalty, as Collins says, to get rid of the mandate. Uh, and that was a, that was a nullity. Uh, so I think the, the question isn't what did Congress intend in 2017, that's easy. It's what weight do we give to their action in 2017? That's the heart of the question. Okay. Uh, anything else where we can go to questions? Please, uh, so questions from, yes, please. Well, I wanted a prediction from both of you, because I think all of us know if this goes to Supreme Court again, well, maybe I shouldn't say it like that, but <laughs> my feeling is if it goes to Supreme Court again, uh, Roberts has made it very clear. He's going <laughs> to do whatever acrobatics is required Woo! Yeah. to save Obamacare yeah. yet again. Yeah. And yeah. they'll do it again, right? So I just wanted to know if you guys agree with me on that. Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, if you read the new book by Joan Biscubi called The Chief about Roberts, it's fairly clear that he did acrobatics like you were. He did acrobatics to uphold the Obamacare law. Look, I actually agree with Omar at one point. If Roberts had said that this is a regulation of commerce and Congress has this power to regulate commerce, and this is what we said since the New Deal, I would have been okay with that, right? I, I think we agree on that point. If he had just done that, I wouldn't have had that much angst over the so case. Your non commerce is the same as commerce. So regulating the lack of commerce is exactly well, the same. Well, I. Your yeah. So regulating actual commerce is actually going on. Yeah, well, I agree with what Roberts ultimately wound up with. My point is, if Roberts had just taken the Omar position and said, this is like Wickard, it's fine, I wouldn't have been angry. I would have disagreed with him. I think that'd be a reasonable opinion. But he did all these acrobatics, like, oh, let me give the conservatives this, and give the liberals that, and this nice little thing. That's what makes me angry about the case. So here he might, you know, do some other acrobatics and says, well, you might take my acrobatics. Well, well we, we'll, we'll just strike down the mandate, or we'll just reimpose a tax cut. Let's make all of Obamacare great again, right? Uh, uh, and, you know, that would really piss me off, I suppose. But, you know, Roberts will do something that I don't like. I don't know what it is, but he'll find a way. And, and also, pay attention to the newest justice as well, see where he falls. I would just say one thing. Um, I, I think that uh, it is acrobatics. I think it's what was done in the National Federation of Doing Business is acrobatics. Um, I also am sympathetic to acrobatics. I think that what Justice Marshall did in Marbury versus Madison was acrobatics. Um, and so uh, sometimes when, and, and sometimes acrobatics can be very done for a worrying motive, I think that is a uh, concern, which is preserving the legitimacy of an institution that is truly at the center of our, of, of our system, and that is um, in a moment of unprecedented fragility, I think, um, uh, our judiciary, I, 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 I think that it is, Thank you. Other questions? Come on. Yes, yes. Uh, going to your point about uh, congressional intent uh, and severability, it seems to me that the first Congress that passed the bond here would not have passed it without the mandate because the insurance companies would have said, we can't do all this unless these other people are forced to pay us money. So the first Congress seems to me would have agreed uh, that it couldn't be severed. I think that that's right. Um, I think that the there's a very good chance that the 2012 Congress would have said none of this works um, unless we've got this provision. And the 2012 Congress was also uh, getting a lot of was on the receiving end of a lot of advocacy 
from an insurance company saying, no, this is going to work mm -hmm. unless this is done. Yeah. Um, however, you can imagine a scenario. Let's say that what happened between 2012 and 2017 is uh, that um, Congress introduced findings concluding that in, indeed um, uh, this isn't critical, that um, asking people to do it is enough, or say that the insurance companies said, you know what, um, uh, uh, we have, have made other uh, practical arrangements here. This is not critical for, for the rule to go forward. Um, what we would focus on is, what was Congress thinking in 2017? Um, because the state of uh, opinion in, in Congress has shifted between 2012 and 2017 about what's necessary. We would necessarily need to focus on 2017 in order to ascertain um, whether this particular provision is important. <coughs> now, Josh makes, a, 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 I think, a, an interesting argument about um, whether it's uh, important as a matter of form for Congress then to um, uh, remove certain findings from the legislative history to say, hey, this is no longer what compels us to take a particular approach. Um, but I, I suppose that one of the reasons I'm not a formalist in this context is that um, so much of the political process has, has famously been, famously been analogized to is, is like a process of sausage making. Um, and uh, to um, ascertain the sort of complexity of intentions um, in uh, sort of uh, animating the 2017 step, um, uh, I think is a, is a difficult undertaking. Um, and so uh, the best that we can do is say, hey, what if they left on the books? Um, and um, in terms of the operative, operative provisions and not focus overly on um, the fact that the yeah, Agreed. I mean, this is why I think it's a formalist, non-formalist argument. If, if Omar is correct, and we can look at the general gestalt, right, the, 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 the sense of the Congress, then yeah. Uh, if I'm right, and we have a stat, it's, it's not actually in the legislative history, it's in the statute. The statutory finding is still there, and they didn't repeal it, and they didn't even try to repeal it. How do you reconcile that? So it's how do you then divine legislative intent for severability? Let me throw one more curveball out there. Uh, Justice Thomas had an opinion last year in a case called Murphy versus the NCAA on severability. And Thomas made a point which I hadn't really considered before. He says, if you have standing to challenge provision X, then the court only has jurisdiction to declare provision X unconstitutional. Right? That the court can't strike down parts of the law affecting hospitals and drug manufacturers. You don't have standing for that. If Thomas is right, then our entire severability doctrines got turned on its head. Because then the court could only kill the mandate and nothing else. But again, if that bleeds over, I think first amendment overbreath is in trouble. I think there are a lot of consequences of that that I haven't fully thought out. But the Thomas opinion is worth considering. Always, you don't have to agree with Thomas, but his opinions, you always have to take them very carefully. Uh, yes, sir. I know you didn't want to talk about this, but I am going to ask you a question sure. about the standing aspect. Sure, yeah. Um, not having a huge breadth of knowledge on the, the standing doctrine, other than the fact that I've seen cases where uh, standing has not been found when it applies generally to taxpayers. Yeah. How then do we have precedents that would show otherwise with the, with the proposal about uh, Okay, good. So the, what he's referring to is taxpayer standing, which means um, I pay tax, therefore I can challenge a federal program. Um, that's not the argument here. The argument I'm making is there's a law that says you shall buy insurance and the government then checks up on you, are you actually buying the insurance? And if you're not, they make you fill out a form. I think there's a fairly pretty close gap between not having insurance and having to fill out this additional form. I agree, it's a trivial injury. I did a debate on this at Penn, he says, well, it's a, it's a soft injury. Okay, fine. Uh, but I think it's an injury in fact. And um, it's possible I'm wrong. Maybe they'll cut the question out next year and that's entirely possible. There's a reason to, right? It, well, th th there's reason not to and I'll tell you why. Um, there is an individual mandate and an employer mandate, right? The employer mandate means you must provide insurance to your employees. Let's say uh, I work for Company X, and Company X says, I gave Josh insurance. Then I fill out my return and say, no, 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 I was uninsured last year. Someone's lying, and they can investigate. In other words, they need that question to enforce the employer mandate. What's the employer, what's the status of the employer? It's in effect for larger companies. Not in effect for everyone, but it's in effect for larger companies, right? 
So in other words, they need that question to double check the employer mandate, which is why I don't think they'll get rid of it, but I'd be very gentle with this, because if I'm wrong, then I'll, I'll withdraw my argument. I think the more compulsion ones are much shakier position, and I, I think we're on the same page. The state standing, I don't think it's gonna work. I do not think it's gonna work, which is why Texas had private plaintiffs, uh, which I think was a uh, Yes, in the back. Could you comment on some of the procedural irregularities in getting the ACA passed? Oh my God, where do I start? Oh my God, don't even, st okay, so. All right, so let me start with the losing argument, right? Uh, the ACA we have was never meant to be the final version of the bill. Let me just start right there. Um, in 2010, if you remember, there were 60 Democrats in Congress, in the Senate, which means they can break a filibuster, right? The, 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 nothing can stop them. Um, on Christmas Eve of 2010, I'm sorry, 2009, um, the Senate passed what's effectively a draft version of the bill. And the idea was, let's pass this now, get all of our members on record, and then we'll send it to the House where Pelosi and others will make it much, much more precise and much better, right? Okay, so they passed this bill December 24th, knowing it would probably come back to them with, with amendments. Ted Kennedy had died over the summer. Scott Brown, a Republican, won the special election in Massachusetts. The Democrat lost the majority. Therefore, they can no longer break a filibuster. So the bill we have now, the Obamacare we bill we have now, was a draft. It was never meant to be final. And why is that important? Because the penalty to enforce the mandate was passed was called budget reconciliation, meaning you don't need a filibuster-proof majority. The reason why the Republicans were able to kill the penalty in 2017 was because of how it was passed in 2010 without a filibuster majority. But that's also important. The mandate was passed with the filibuster majority. The penalty was passed without it. So the Republicans in 2017 could not repeal the mandate without having a filibuster proof majority. In other words, the procedure of why this law was enacted gives rise to this challenge in my severability position. Not what you're expecting, but there it is. I could talk about the ACA procedure for hours. I mean, the, uh, someone mentioned the Tax Anti-Injunction Act. Uh, 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 the, 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 could the budget reconciliation process be used in this fashion? Uh, there were lots of irregularities. Um, Anyway, they lost. Okay, other questions? Yes, in the back. Yeah, there seems to be a shifting of responsibilities and burdens for a lot of the laws that have passed the United States for the past 50 years. You mentioned the legislature should have just drafted the appropriate statutes <clears throat> because they couldn't now that the courts are trying to do their thing. Hmm? Why is this happening? Is it, can we prevent this from happening in the future? Oh, boy. Omar, you want to take a stab at that one? You're, you're, much, more, you're much more veteran than I am in this one. I think that, uh, gosh, <laughs> why is this happening? I, I, uh, I, I think that to some extent it's a, a function of uh, the polarization in our political institutions. And so when we are dealing with circumstances um, in which it's not just the case that there are uh, very deeply held um, opposing views, but uh, that the um, sort of mechanisms uh, for preserving civil deliberation um, and sort of meeting the middle have been encumbered. Um, uh, and there are a whole array of steps that have been taken over the last number of years and um, uh, for which both parties can be blamed uh, in part. Um, that it becomes very difficult for the legislative process to move fluidly, to get to a point where we can say, okay, let's um, come up with a concept, uh, let's get the opposition to cut it a bit, mm -hmm. let's make changes to it, but at the end of the day, um, wind up with um, a uh, law that is better than, uh, I mean, maybe not as good as what we hoped, but better than um, these days, um, you can hardly make law. I mean, it's one of the great best examples of that is um, because of the politics. And so I, we end up obliged to re-process uh, um, the legal framework that we've got already to uh, jerry-rig it to fit changing needs. And sometimes that ends up sort of being handed to the courts. Uh, uh, and, uh, and the courts sometimes take that on uh, with excitement, and other times, as in the case uh, that we were discussing earlier, the reason that Chief Justice Roberts say, if, if we are not careful, then we are going to be burned by this very hot political 
higher in the program is going to be going. How to address this, um, to my mind, is to um, uh, embrace moderates, uh, to, to not assume that people at each end of the political spectrum necessarily have the best answers, um, and to um, put pressure on our political leaders for uh, sort of stability. But that's easier said than done, especially when you feel strongly about whether you're going to have to your kids in the health care uh, or if you're forced to eat broccoli. Uh, buy broccoli, not eat it, but buy it. <laughs> buy it, that's right. That's right. I think you have a due process problem to make you eat broccoli. <laughs> that's I, true. I, I was, that's true. I think it might violate the Eighth Amendment that makes you eat broccoli. Yeah. What's that? It violates the Eighth Amendment also. Yeah, yeah. It's very unusual. It's true. Force feeding. Uh, I think maybe one more question. No? Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, best thing we can do if we want to have talks like this in the future is uh, to continue to support that sock join us on uh, Facebook. Uh, join us on Facebook, look, look for our stuff, and uh, I also welcome, as does the rest of the board, ideas for, uh, for talks, uh, because we can search out not only uh, Josh Blackman, but any number of different speakers on different topics nationwide. How many speakers we got? Oh, there are hundreds. Yeah, so really happy. And if there's any members that are part of the judiciary locally, um, they are also welcome to be added to the list of not listed on here. Wonderful. So b bottom line is, we you want to hear about it, we can talk about it. So thanks, thanks again for coming, and thank you both to Professor so Blackman and Professor John. <laughs> 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 <laughs>